It might be the oldest profession, but prostitution and other forms of sex work are also among the most prohibited and heavily regulated around the world. At the latest Reason Speakeasy, a monthly live event in New York City with outspoken defenders of free speech and heterodox thinking, I talked with Caitlin Bailey, the founder and head of Old Pros, a sex worker rights group, and the writer and performer of Whore's Eye View, a one-woman show about 10,000 years of prostitution, female emancipation, and sexual freedom. Bailey and Old Pros seek not just to decriminalize sex work, but to destigmatize it too arguing that sex workers across the centuries have not only provided a much-in-demand service, but helped to push the boundaries of freedom and liberty. Uh, Caitlin, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So let's get started by talking about what is Old Pros. Yeah, Old Pros is a nonprofit media organization, and we are focused on creating the conditions to change the social and legal status of sex workers. And we believe that by changing the story, uh, we can change laws and policies. Okay. So it's magical thinking. A little right? bit, yeah. yes. I, you know, policy flowing downstream of culture and narrative change, right. you know. it's um, what, what are your activities? Uh, well, we produce a ton of content. So we produce the Oldest Profession podcast mm -hmm. where we, you know, partner with professional historians uh, and do a deep dive on different sex workers from history. This has been um, a really powerful tool for reminding folks, especially legislators, that sex workers have always been contributing members uh, of mm -hmm. communities. Um, I have a, uh, a one woman show, Whore's Eye View, that is a, you know, 75 minute lecture covering mm -hmm. 10,000 years of history from a sex worker's perspective. We've produced uh, a ton of one pagers and talking points that we widely distribute uh, amongst allied organizations. And we host events. Uh, we had our first live event last night, the mm -hmm. Old Pros Show. Um, and I'm thrilled to announce that we sold out. That's great. Oh, yeah. right, you've sold out? We you so meant you sold all the tickets. You're yeah, we sold all out. the tickets, yes. Although I no. guess prostitutes, like, like rock, or they're not rock stars. They don't mind selling out. Well, I mean, right? That's yes. the point. It, 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 is, it is sex for money, for sure. Uh, yeah. But, you know, some people do that to avoid selling out. That's right. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the um, old pros or, or the oldest profession mm -hmm. podcast. When you, you say you talk about history, um, you know, who was the most recent guest and – what were you talking about? Sure. So we, we cover um, old pros from history. So mm -hmm. we, we don't have guests yet, but we, oh. we hope to do that next season. Mm -hmm. we, we talk mostly about dead people. Uh, but we covered Lizzie Lape, who was this incredible, prolific uh, madam in Ohio. She ran mm -hmm. a network, uh, and she she was really the, one of the first generations, uh, a member of the first generation of women to be able to keep their property uh, after a divorce. And so she was able to build her empire as an entrepreneur and a sex worker. This 19 century? Or? Yeah, this is early, early 19th century. She was born, um, she was a young child in, in the beginning of the Civil War. So mm -hmm. yeah, late 19th century. Was prostitution legal then? Or? It's, it's complicated. Uh, sex work wasn't criminalized in this country until the progressive era. We criminalized, you know, prostitution, alcohol, and abortion, actually, mm -hmm. all at the same because time. Because each leads to the next, right? Yes, yeah. that, that was the theory uh, yeah. of many moral. It's not a bad theory. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, sorry to do a, a deep, because, uh, abortion and contraception is almost as old as the oldest profession. Right. It's actually, it, it is interesting. They, they do go, go together. Sex workers have been sharing knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. about how to both encourage and limit pregnancy for literally all of human history. Yeah. yeah. Um, when, uh, when we talk about sex work, um, can you, I, cause I know this will come up. Sure. There's a, you know, when we talk about drug legalization, we talk yes. about mostly about legalization, not decriminalization. Mm -hmm. When we talk about sex work, decriminalization and legalization are different and Very distinct different. things. Can you just lay that out? Before Absolutely. We talk about yeah, I think the big difference between, you know, drugs and sex workers is that, you know, sex workers are service providers. We're not commodities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can't be governed uh, and regulated in the same way. And so what we found with legalization, it actually really reduces the negotiating power of providers and doesn't lead to 
to good results. Nevada, I think, is the best example. It's the only state in the country with legal regulated prostitution, and it has the highest arrest rate per capita for prostitution-related offenses. So uh, can you walk through that, though? Totally. In Nevada, there's, what, one or two counties that allow? There, yeah, there are a few rural counties. The um, The rule is that um, any county with more than 700,000 uh, residents is barred from, from having a, a legally licensed brothel. So it is impossible to work legally where the highest demand is. Mm -hmm. But the other problem is that in order to work as a legally licensed prostitute in Nevada, you have to register with the sheriff's department. You have to put yourself on a stigmatized list. This becomes subpoenable for the rest of your life. You can mm -hmm. imagine how this comes up in child custody cases. You also have to work at a brothel. Uh, you know, you pay room and board, you're giving the house 50%, and they don't really provide a lot of services. Brothels are not legally allowed to advertise. So, you know, it's it, 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 it's really kind of a, a silly situation. And, and more importantly, as a legally licensed prostitute in Nevada, when your shift ends, you can't just go to a bar or go to the movies or go out about town. Your freedom of movement is limited because you are a legally licensed prostitute, because all of these laws were created with the idea of containing and controlling sex workers and protecting the local communities when, from them. When did uh, the 1970s. prostitution begin? 1970s. Yeah. And at that point, it was seen probably, though, as a, a leap forward for Prog uh, progressive or liberal or tolerance or something, right? Well, it's interesting. I mean, Nevada has mm. has a very interesting uh, yeah. history. Uh, nobody was paying attention to the law criminalizing prostitution before its legalization. And so its legalization actually created a, a state-enforced monopoly that benefited sort of a, a small number of license mm. holders and really to the exclusion not just of other brothel you know, operators, but also of independent sex workers. And it has no real effect on prostitution, right? It, I mean, it has effects, but it doesn't stop it in the counties with more than 700,000 people or Las Vegas. Nothing such. we've ever done has yeah. stopped the oldest profession. Yeah. yeah. it's Well, and again, that's an interesting parallel with drug prohibition. Yes. You know, you can prohibit everything and it doesn't mean you stop the behavior. Correct. So what is decriminalization and how is it distinct from legalization? Sure. Decriminalization means removing criminal penalties from adult consensual sex work, right? And so, uh, you know, this means that nobody is arrested, evicted, fired, or loses custody of their children just for engaging in this work, right? It doesn't legalize rape. It doesn't legalize kidnapping. It doesn't legalize any of the harms around uh, exploitation. It makes it easier, actually, for victims of these crimes to report crimes committed against them because they themselves are no longer in violation of the law. Legalization, however, creates a legal or regulatory process that people have to go through in order to engage in prostitution legally. So it creates a barrier to access. It inevitably creates a two-tiered system. Uh, and it, what we found is that it doesn't do much to reduce, you know, threats of violence uh, against the most, you know, the most vulnerable. It's important to create a system where if somebody wakes up on a random day and just decides to engage in prostitution and something bad happens to them, that they're able to report that crime that they committed, even if they didn't fill out a license, even if they didn't do the right paperwork. Um, in a decriminalization scheme, would that allow for local regulation or, or where are you coming from as an organization? What kind of laws that sure. do you support? Our first priority as an organization is to stop the arrests, right? Mm -hmm. That's the most immediate harm. We've seen, you know, a lot of creative solutions. I think there are more creative solutions possible once you remove that that threat of criminal penalty. I'm really impressed with the way that New Zealand has handled this. They decriminalized adult consensual prostitution in 2003. Um, and they have, you know, local ordinances determining, you know, what is and isn't allowed in terms of public advertising. They have some really great regulations around, you know, the difference between a a sole proprietor in a business and at what point, you know, like business rules that apply to all businesses with employee employees. Um, and they've done a lot of great work on the civil level, increasing uh, the negotiating power of providers for like condoms, etc., without creating, you know, a criminal system that punishes people for. Why did they um, do that? I think they just, you know, 
don't have the same hangups that we do mm. around sex. You know, the, the decriminalization. You know, when I think of sexual liberation, I'm not thinking of New Zealand. I, I think, I think that's uh, fair. Uh, but, but they, but they don't have the same kind of, you know, puritanical mm. background that we mm -hmm. do. And during the AIDS epidemic in the, the 1970s and 1980s, they got a group of, of experts together and asked the question, how can we reduce, uh, HIV AIDS? And they came back with, well, we should definitely stop arresting people for having and using condoms, which is how prostitution was being enforced. And that, you know, led them down a path of, of asking themselves, how can we make our communities safer and healthier? And they came away with, well, we should remove the criminal penalties around adult prostitution. Hmm. And it really has reduced violence and STIs. Wow. Um, what uh, you, you mentioned, New Zealand doesn't have the puritanical background that the U.S. has, but New Zealand's the only country on the planet that has decriminalized prostitution. So it's not simply puritanical, you know, it's not 17th century religious doctrine sure. that is keeping every country from legalizing prostitution. What do you see, or decriminalizing it, what do you see as the main impetus to keep the oldest profession mm -hmm. always kind of in the black or gray market? I mean, it's obviously a very old stigma, right? Mm -hmm. Against, you know, sex workers, whores, uh, you know, I, I trace this sort of back. Journalists. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Politicians. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, it, we, we tr I think I, I initially traced this back to sort of our transition from, you know, uh, Worshiping fertility goddesses essentially to uh, a paternalistic god, and the, the you know the devaluation of women's contribution, and so the the sacred whore, right, the archetypal whore, is is a part of that denigration, and and we lose uh, you know a lot of those stories. But I think the the global suppression of prostitution can really trace its history back to the uh, you know the early twentieth century and World War One and World War Two, where as a part of our you know national policy. Uh, the, you know, the British did it with the Contagious Diseases Acts. We did it with the Draft Act and what would come to be known as the American Plan. But we deputized law enforcement to arrest not prostitutes, promiscuous women hmm. uh, within a five-mile radius of military bases trying to protect um, our soldiers from STIs. This was not an effective policy, uh, you know, for its stated objective. Uh, however, we we really globalized that because American bases and British bases, both of which had very similar policies, exported that policy all over the world. Um, it's also tied in, similar to the, the gag rule, right, with information about abortion. Um, we've conflated uh, human trafficking um, and adult consensual sex work for so long, it's woven into our global policies. So, you know, non-government organizations can't get funding if they even talk about decriminalizing sex work. Could you talk about human trafficking? Because this sure. is a, a story that we hear all the time, yes. that we are living through the worst moment in human trafficking, that human trafficking is everywhere. Is that wrong? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> It's obviously hard to get good numbers about a criminalized and stigmatized class, but you know, according to the uh, the State Department's own numbers, uh, if you're looking at violent exploitation, the sex industry does not make the top five industries that are you know most responsible for the violent exploitation of vulnerable labor. It's domestic labor, it's agriculture, it's mining, it's textiles. We absolutely have a problem with exploited labor in this country. The problem is that we've made prostitution a symbol of that exploitation rather than dealing with the exploitation itself. And so by raising the negotiating power of victims, which one way to do that is to remove criminal penalties against mm -hmm. them, um, would be a great way of addressing some of these root problems. Um, but, you know, instead we, we would, we'd rather focus on a scapegoat. Yeah. You know, why, why is, um, you know, prostitution the scapegoat? That uh, that narrative really starts with the um, the you know the white slave panic of the early nineteenth century. You know this is sort of early twentieth. Yes, century, excuse right? me, yeah. early nineteen yeah. early nineteen hundreds, twentieth century. Um, it's um, it's interesting. Uh, you know, it's sort of leading up to women's suffrage. We we get this moral panic uh, around 
women having the freedom of movement. Um, we've, uh, you know, we've made the transition sort of from like demonization and, and witchcraft in the medieval period to sort of like disease vectors of disease uh, in the wake of the scientific revolution. But um, you know, this begins uh, really an unholy alliance between Christian conservatives on the one hand who are very interested in removing pornography from public places, ending access to contraception and abortion, and cracking down on, on prostitution as a, a symbol of all this evil, and the early feminist and temperance movement, um, you know, which sort of conflated uh, prostitution, um, which, you know, there are a lot of horror stories that come out of a society where women don't have property rights, uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, their experience in sex work, uh, you know, when you live in a society, if you you know if you had sex on on one date, uh, you are ruined for the rest of your life and must right. live in a brothel. That that does create uh, ingredients for uh, a deeply exploitative situation. But this is when you start to see um, the shuttering of brothels. Um, you know, 1910 is the. Uh, yep. I'm sorry to nerd out a little bit. Yeah. I, I can hear my, I'm correcting myself in my head. The, the first uh, anti-prostitution policy in the U.S. is actually our first anti-immigration law, and that's the Page Act, which prevents people from immigrating to this country for the purposes of prostitution. And that is still one of the things if you, yes. if you were a prostitute, you're yes. not allowed to legally immigrate here. Correct. And that's getting really scary with facial recognition technology as we're, you know, scraping ads. You do not have to be arrested for engaging in sex work to be denied entry at a border as a known prostitute, which I think is something that we should all uh, sit with and take very seriously. But anyway, so the, the Page Act introduces the language of immigrating here for immoral purposes. And then that is repeated in 1910 with the Mann Act, otherwise known as the White Slave Law, which makes it a crime to transport a woman across state lines for immoral purposes. And much like our anti-trafficking laws today, this was sold to the American people as a way of, of cracking down on white slavery, on, on saving, rescuing sex slaves that were being kidnapped left and right. Um, that didn't happen. We did not rescue any sex slaves, but we did prosecute a lot of interracial relationships and we did disrupt a lot of chorus girls on their way to their next gig. Um. You know, it, it, you you mentioned the Women's Christian uh, Temperance Union, which was one of the major forces behind Prohibition, mm -hmm. which was also a progressive, capital P, progressive outfit. Sure. These days, we think of people, um, you know, if you're religious, you're right wing and you are, you know, anti-sex. Um, and if you're a progressive, you are comfortable with, you know, 57 flavors of sexuality, sure. blah, blah, blah. But and the the contemporary uh, description is wrong, but can you talk a little bit about how these, you know, back in the day, how did these forces sit with one another? Because there was also fear of immigration, Absolutely. fear of urbanization for the first time yes. in the 20th century. More people were living in cities rather than the mm -hmm. countryside. Uh, uh, alcohol uh, prohibition was a big part of this because yeah. European, you know, the the immigrants who were coming from Europe tended to be from Central Europe and Southern uh, mm -hmm. Europe. They were either Catholic or Jewish, but they drank. Yep. Um, you know, what? Where, where did that all kind of coalesce into this progressive movement that is kind of like an anti-sex movement? It is an anti-sex movement, and I think that you're absolutely right, that a lot of it is centered on xenophobia, right? We see that with the Page Act, right? We see that with a lot of the prohibitionist language. We see that with the even the way that, you know, on the one hand, um, you know, sex workers from, uh, you know, China or the East are coming and, and infecting and corrupting our cities. And also, on the other hand, the the traffickers, right? Like always an immigrant, right, who's coming and, and representing an, an existential threat. Um, and we do see a lot of anxiety around sexual behavior at this time. You know, the, the bicycle is invented and that gives women just an unprecedented freedom of movement um, that like upsets dads across the country. Um, the automobile is, yeah. you know, shortly followed. And, th and there's a massive, uh, you know, migration right from the country into cities where you have access to bars and music and uh, and nightlife that often gets um, conflated and is also deeply connected to sex work. Mm. So, um, How uh, you started Old Pros in 2020? In 2020, yeah, okay, which yeah. was a weird good, year to start yeah, good, things. Uh, yeah. in, in the fall of 2020. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> so, you, you know, we're going through a global pandemic and I guess you're <laughs> like, well, I got nothing else to do, so I'll start a sex worker right group. <laughs> 
It's, um, well, yeah, my, my trajectory, um, I, I, I come to this work uh, by, by way of stand-up comedy, right? Mm-hmm. I, I was a stand-up comic for, uh, you know, over a decade, traveling the country, uh, being very happy, trading, you know, beer for stories. Um, and I started the Oldest Profession podcast in my capacity as a, as a stand-up comic. I, you know, was excited to finally use my degree, and it was something that I, I had a natural interest in. What I, was your degree? History. Um, yeah. Um, and so, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, and I wrote my senior thesis on the economic structure of brothels from, uh, you know, night leading up to, to women's suffrage. And so it's always been an area of interest in mine. I have done sex work uh, a few times in my life. Um, but I, I started it uh, as as a comic. You know, I was reading, reading Wikipedia and mouthing off. Um, and then Sesta Fawcett passed, and so can you ex- unpack that? Absolutely. Uh, explain the um, the acronym. Sure. Yes. Uh, so in um, in April of 2018, uh, Donald Trump signed one of the most popular bipartisan pieces of legislation um, called Sesta Fawcett, which stands for Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking and Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. This was sold again to the American people as a way of saving vulnerable children from sexual exploitation. Uh, Amy. Schumer did, uh, you know, uh, several commercials about it. You know, my, my mom was convinced that this was uh, a moral imperative. And our the solution um, was to remove the places that sex workers had been using to schedule and screen our clients for uh, decades. This is when Backpage is seized by the FBI. This is when Craigslist Erotic Services uh, goes away. Um, and I saw sort of the immediate detrimental impact that that was having on my peers. And I, I can say with authority, and there have been many follow-up studies, um, this law didn't make anyone safer. Uh, it pushed sex work further underground. Uh, law enforcement has come out in many places talking about how much more difficult it is to find uh, victims of, of exploitation and to prosecute them. Um, you know, Backpage has a, a long and, and well-documented history, uh, especially thanks to the incredible journalism of Elizabeth Nolan Brown. Um, mm, at of, Reason. Talk, yes, at Reason. Backpage.com was a online classifieds ad program that did a lot on sex work and uh, things. Can you explain a little bit how places like Backpage or how did the internet enable safer uh, sex work? Yeah, I think yeah, that's a that's a great point. So I, I you know I like to, to sort of go back through the the history of sex work because I think it's important to understand um, sort of the different. Um, you know, forces at play. Sex work is, is fundamentally a sales job, right? You you have a service and you're looking for customers or clients to to come in and participate in, in the services that you're selling. And so procuring clients is an important part of our job. And so, you know, before sex work was criminalized, the overwhelming majority of sex work is happening in mostly women-owned and controlled brothels, right? There was a, a place in town that would develop a reputation and you as a sex worker would, you know, go there and, there, and participate in a system. You could share knowledge. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, of good that came out of that. Madams were some of the largest landowners and were hugely responsible for settling the West. When you shutter the brothels, when you criminalize sex work, when you criminalize promiscuity, you make it impossible for, for sex workers to procure their own clients. This is where you need a third party manager. And because of the criminalization of sex work, you need a man to navigate public spaces in order to reduce your risk of being arrested. So this is when the, you know, the pimp or the mail manager or the taxi driver or the concierge gets involved in, in sex work. Um, and so what the internet did is it allowed sex workers to post their own ads and schedule and screen their own clients without having to put themselves in, in public spaces. So it reduced the risk either of potentially violent clients, but it really reduced the rest, the risk of arrest, which has always been, you know, since criminalization, that's our number one threat. It is kind of, you know, in the 80s and 90s, uh, as the internet came online, uh, people talked about disintermediation, that that's what one of the, the power of the internet was, it was going to get rid of middlemen and, and customer and, uh, you know, or seller and buyer could mm-hmm. to deal directly. And it's interesting to think that sex work is one of the purest cases yes. of disintermediation. Yeah, I mean, sex workers have been at the forefront of so many technological innovations, especially in communication and finance. You know, we really are 
cutting edge. Um, there's a great book that just came out uh, called How uh, How Sex Changed the Internet and the Internet Changed Sex that mm -hmm. documents and credits sex workers with building and popularizing much of the early internet. Uh, so are you excited about the metaverse then? That's I, the next stage? Or I, once, I, once where they get the legs down, they can work on genitals? Look, or yeah, it's, no. I, I know that they're... <laughs> There's already sex work happening on the metaverse, yeah. uh, but it's I uh, I'm retired. <laughs> um, what is the well? Let's talk a little bit about your experiences. Sure. Um, you know, because this is something you know. There's a prurient dimension to it, of mm -hmm. course, but also you know, how did you get into sex work and why? You know, why did you do that? Sure, I I came to sex work from a place of rebellion. You know, I am I am not a go along to get along person. Um, I came of age during uh, the George W. Bush's second administration and abstinence only education. Um, I remember sitting through uh, demonstrations at my public school where religious leaders would come in and, and give us misinformation about uh, about our body, and engaging in sex work felt. Uh, like a way to both push back against that misinformation and also to sort of like reclaim, uh, my own body. Mm -hmm. Um, and it felt, and it was also a great way to do the amount of sex that I wanted to do without developing a reputation at my school because no one could afford me. You so, uh, grew up in <laughs> North Carolina? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I came to sex work, um, a second time in my life to subsidize my early career in comedy, which, mm -hmm pays in um, exposure and would be, I think, a better example of exploitation. Yeah. Do, um, one question, um, I get this a lot in libertarian circles, is that people who participate in sex work either are traumatized, and that's why they go into it, or they are traumatized by engaging in it. Um, you know, is that sociologically, is that accurate? Or I, I think you can make a better case for that with, with comedy, honestly. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I think yeah. that, yeah, sex workers are, you know, I think we're a, a, a self-selected group of entrepreneurs. Um, I think that sex work has subsidized more educations and mm -hmm. um, artistic careers and, you know, startups than all of the grants and all of the world combined. I know sex work as the oldest profession has always been many things to many people. And it's difficult to make, you know, sort of broad, uh, you know, broad statements, I think that, um, you know, all labor exists on a spectrum of, of choice, circumstance, and, and coercion. Mm -hmm. But the criminalized nature of sex work and and living with the, the stigma of that and navigating the world and your personal relationships mm -hmm. from a place of being a member of a criminalized class, mm -hmm. I think can certainly have an effect. But no, I, I don't think that uh, I don't think that trauma is overrepresented. I, I think we unfortunately live in a society where there's there's a lot of trauma. Um, part of Old Pro's mission is not just to decriminalize, but to destigmatize Correct. sex work. You're married. I uh, am. You know, I don't know if your husband is in the audience or you might be watching, but he knows about your past. Yeah, my husband has for sure Googled me. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's and, not a secret. Uh, well, and, <laughs> and what are, you know, what goes into destigmatizing yeah. sex work, both on a kind of social or mm -hmm. societal level, but then also on a personal level? Because many people have hang ups about you know, uh, their partner's sex lives, sure. whether they were giving it away for free or, <laughs> sure. you know, charging top dollar. Yeah, we certainly have a lot of opinions about yeah. uh, who other people have sex with. But, yeah, uh, yeah no, I um, I believe that it's important to destigmatize um, sex work in general and, and prostitution in particular because I think that sex workers have so much wisdom to add to the communities that we're already in. And this stigma ends up silencing us. We have so much to contribute to conversations around consent, uh, around sexual health, around mental health and addiction. Um, but we're not allowed to bring, you know, our full lived experience to, to these conversations because of the stigma. Um, so how do you destigmatize it? I think that you you tell the story of sex workers. So many incredible people have engaged in this work. The greatest pirate to ever live was a sex worker. Uh, you know, the first woman to run for president was a sex worker. Uh, you know, we've... We're, I mean, I'm biased, but I think we're amazing. And I think if more people knew uh, the contributions, the material uh, social contributions that sex workers have made, we could sort of claim our legacy and bring that knowledge and wisdom um, into the rest of our lives. Is there, you mentioned sex work 
and prostitution. Mm -hmm. What is the distinction that you draw? Sure. Sex work is a really big, broad umbrella term that includes all erotic labor, both criminalized and not criminalized, right? So whether you're talking about in-person prostitution, OnlyFans work, stripping, foot fetish model, you know, I'm trying to build a, you know, a big coalition. I want to include Hooters waitresses, you know, anyone exchanging erotic labor for money or something of value is a sex worker. Prostitution is a more specific uh, category of sex work that refers to uh, mostly criminalized, in-person, full-service sex work. Is sex work overwhelmingly women? That is certainly the perception. Uh, the few studies that have been done, and again, I want to caveat this, with it is very hard to get good numbers on a stigmatized and criminalized class, uh, have found that most providers, right, somewhere in the range of 70% uh, self-identify as women and 30% self-identify as men, but that like 95% of the clients um, are men. So, you know, that seems to be the breakdown. And they've found interesting, actually, when you're talking about uh, youth prostitution, when you're talking about under the age of 18, it's actually about a 50-50 split because you're Mm -hmm. often seeing people who are leaving um, an abusive home and that, you know, abuse doesn't discriminate based on gender. Um. In terms of, uh, you know, sex work seems to be having a moment, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and and obviously it's always been there and things like that. But because of the Internet, because of things like OnlyFans Mm -hmm. and during the pandemic, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, camming or, you know, being a cam girl, everybody was doing it. Right. Um, Is is it accurate that is sex work on the rise? I don't think Um, that we are seeing more people today engage in prostitution than at any other point in human history. For one thing, mm -hmm. you know, women have uh, more access to other employment you know, options. So I think that you've, you've seen other moments where there's been um, an increase. I do think that you are seeing an increase in visibility. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that that necessarily translates into reduced stigma or decriminalization. I know a lot of OnlyFans models, people engaged in perfectly legal sex work where they, you know, never engage physically with another person who have lost scholarships, been kicked out of school, lost their their day gig or been denied housing uh, because they became known to, you know, their potential employer or, right. you know, faculty advisor or landlord. Yeah, we've uh, we've discussed a bunch of those stories at Reason, mm-hmm. including yeah. a couple times uh, people who were cops when yeah. they were cops. Yeah. And I guess actually going back a bit, uh, Norma Jean Omadovar, yes. uh, who had a, a, a member of the LAPD who uh, was a call girl mm-hmm. and uh, wrote a memoir from called From Cop to Call Girl. Yeah. Made into a TV movie. Uh, yeah. She's quite a trip. She's amazing. She's also a, a one-woman archivist. She's sort of yeah. been single-handedly keeping the the history um, of the more recent sex worker rights movement. Mm-hmm. So we we are all indebted to Norma Jean. Yeah, talk a little bit. Speaking of kind of the you you mentioned in passing that um, madams or prostitute sex workers mm-hmm. kind of help settle the West. Yeah, that is um, you know you see that vaguely in shows like uh, Gunsmoke. I mean, Miss Kitty is a saloon owner, but. Right. You know, it's kind of laundered version of a madam. Mm-hmm. Um, how did that work? And um, sure. when did that story start disappearing? Yeah. So, you know, um, madams, uh, there were a lot of there were a lot of weird laws around alcohol and saloons, and and some of it was broken down on on gender. And I don't want to get too into the specifics, but there were a couple of loopholes that really allowed uh, women to become uh, business owners, and as madams, they became big business owners. Um, and what you see over and over again is that these brothels really become city centers. They're where people go to drink. They're where people go to party. Uh, you know, they incubate jazz, just as an example. Mm. Um, and so these madams, right, they invest in public infrastructure. You know, Luke Graham, who funds the Seattle public schools. Uh, you know, Lizzie Lape was a, you know, known uh, to, to, you know, give a lot of money away to, to charities. You see these stories about madams investing in, you know, water and, and basic resources mm. because they're you know, so they're bringing some of the first women out to yeah, these frontier and in towns. The, in the West, I mean, women are a scarce commodity, Correct. right? Or, yeah, yeah, these are labor camps out West. You know, you're talking about like, you know, when you're talking about white people, you're talking about like a 70 to 1 ratio. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when a madam comes to town, it's not really safe, you know, to bring your to bring your wife. So she's setting up and doing big business. And the, the women that work there, there's a lot of purchasing power uh, mm-hmm. that comes with that. And it, there's... 
you know, the, one of the reasons that I think it was Wisconsin uh, was one of the first states in the union to give women the right to vote. They had a lot of sex workers who were major property owners, and it felt weird that they weren't able to fully participate in civic life. Yeah, and I've read that uh, Wyoming did yes, that Wyoming, partly yes. to – I mixed those up. Oh, okay. I misspoke. Yeah, it was Wyoming, yeah. but Sorry. to pull uh, women out there. Yeah. I mean, it was like, yeah, you can vote. Yeah, um, I think now maybe it would be you know you can live in Wyoming and you don't have to vote <laughs> right. or something. But um, let's uh, talk a little bit about Whore's Eye View. Sure. Okay. You don't want to talk more about my husband because he's kind of great. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, in in terms of destigmatization. Sure. Um, so like on a societal level, mm -hmm. um, the, the strategy is let's tell the stories, let's recover the past, and let's deal with you know the benefits and costs of uh, uh, mm -hmm. criminalizing sex work. Um, yeah, on a personal level. But right? there's also, yeah, the, I think the power of proximity um, is is very powerful. You know, I, I met my husband in high school. We were on the same debate team. Uh, we led very different lives for uh, almost two decades after that um, and, and reconnected. But he absolutely knows about my work. He's come to see me perform uh, many times. He's a, a big supporter of the decriminalization yeah. um, and destigmatization of sex work. And we are also in, you know, a monogamous sort of, I mean, not, I mean, he, I guess conventional tradition. Yeah, marriage. conventional, yeah, conventional yeah. marriage. And we yeah. go to you, places yeah, as a couple. You it know? is <laughs> typical at a reason event where people stutter and are kind of afraid yeah. to say, I am in a completely conventional relationship. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's like, well, it's not that, yeah. it's not that conventional. It's pretty conventional. Yeah. You know, Sometimes like, he does the cooking or, yeah, right? I, well, yeah, no. it's, yeah, no. no, for sure. But, it, you know, we, we got, we got married in, in late 2019 um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's been great to uh, to have a partner yeah. and to to talk about these issues and to you know have a strategist. How old are you? I am a uh, great question. I am thirty six. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, among the various <laughs> questions of like sex work seems to be you know more visible than ever, even mm -hmm. if it's not increasing. Uh, you know, people talk about the sex recession, particularly among younger people. Um, baby boomers apparently have more sex than, uh, than Gen X, who have more sex than millennials, et cetera. I like to, when people talk about a sex recession, I believe that it's, you know, when I, uh, when you are not having sex, it's a recession. When I am not having sex, it's a depression. <laughs> um, but what is, I mean, do these things ring true to you? I mean, what I, there's an interesting paradox going on where sex is more visible than ever, and it seems to be happening less. I just think it's fascinating to see the sex panic go in reverse. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I was growing up, the concern was that the kids were having too much sex. And right. so it's interesting to see the moral panic reverse that mm -hmm. the older generation is, you know, concerned uh, about the next generation not having enough sex. But and the important thing is that we are talking about right, sex. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah it yeah. seems interesting. It's like, I think that the older generations of, uh, you know, th these moral panics are not new. And right. so, you know, I think the kids are going to figure it out. Yeah. Um, there's also that uh, a kind of concurrent question or, or fear that we're not reproducing enough. Again, like I, I, I think that how, how do I? I have strong opinions about this, you know, because I think that so much of this call comes from. Um, you know, sort of a, uh, a romanticized notion about the way things used to be. And I think that there are definitely things that we could do, right, to make, uh, you know, having children in this in this society more attractive. I don't think that, like... Like uh, ra having other people raise your kids. That would be right? super helpful, yeah. right? Yeah, like, just, like cheap funding. domestic labor. Uh, yes, yeah. I, th there are other solutions, but I don't think that, yeah. like, limiting... I, I always see this call sort of immediately followed by... Uh, limiting access to, to contraception or abortion. And I, I think it's really important that we resist the temptation uh, to turn women into not people. I think that we really, really need to stay focused on us as like active agents in, in our own lives. And although all of our choices impact all of us, um, I don't know that controlling uh, w whether you're encouraging or discouraging the fertility uh, of women is like a, a smart and, or good But move. again, this is kind of a paradox where we women have more autonomy over their bodies now than ever in human history, right? And, and culturally, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just kind of technologically. And there's always a backlash against mm -hmm. that. And uh, before we talk about Horse Eye View, could you talk a bit about, uh, you mentioned, you know, FOSTA-SESTA and things mm -hmm. like that, but 
this coalition of kind of right-wing, typically uh, conservatives of a religious bent, and then there is a group of feminists yep. who are very anti-porn, tend to be anti-sex work. They yep. either see it as the excrescence of capitalism or um, it is patriarchal, ultimately because 95% of the customers right. are men, et cetera. So um, can you talk a little bit about wh when did that coalition begin and then how did it morph into uh, an anti-porn panic and now mm -hmm. an anti-trafficking panic? Yeah, I mean, this this coalition really dates back to uh, the, the Seneca Falls Convention and the sort of first so that's earliest like feminist. So and that's yeah. the this first is, big women's rights. Uh, this is group, Elizabeth you know. Cady Stanton and Susan right. B. Anthony, right. you know, putting their heads together. And, and creating a version of the Declaration of uh, Women's Rights yes, in America. Absolutely. Modeled on the Declaration of Independence. Yes, where yeah. the, the most, you know, the, the spiciest take was that women should vote. Yeah. Uh, it was considered a pipe dream at that point, mm -hmm. um, which I think is interesting. But they were very interested um, and also motivated to distance themselves from sex workers, which I mm -hmm. think is you know, fascinating and tragic because, as I said, sex workers were some of the biggest landowners. They were some of the biggest property owners. They were running businesses. You know, a, a woman that I mentioned earlier, Victoria Woodhall, was one of the first brokerage, she had one of the first brokerage firms on Wall Street um, and was a sex worker. And she was also the first woman to address Congress on the issue of suffrage, but she was shunned by early feminist uh, thinkers because they didn't want to be associated uh, with whores. And you see um, early feminists really coalescing um, around bar culture, right? Around drinking, uh, around brothels, around pornography. And again, you know, you see this repeated in the porn wars with, you know, Gloria Steinem, uh, you know, Catherine McKinnon, conflating and using prostitution as a symbol of violence against women rather than addressing actual violence against women, which I, I think is interesting because, you know, if you're looking for the primary culprit, uh, you know, domestic violence is the the number one place that, that women are most vulnerable. It's not in uh, paid sex. Uh, that's not where most of this violence is happening. Um, how does that, uh, you know, a lot of second wave feminism, late 60s, early 70s, that was also very anti-marriage. Uh, mm -hmm. Gloria Steinem was famously against marriage until sure. she embraced it later in life. But um, what, you know, so it, what's the role of sex? Like, is, is it just, you know, that uh, certain types of feminists just are uncomfortable with sex or? Um, I think, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think, you know, you, it is important to put the history of prostitution and the, you know, it's like feminist, feminist backlash against it in its proper context. There were lots of people engaged in sex work who didn't want to be because they lived in a society that was demonizing sex so much, right? That if you slipped up one time or you, you know, had, uh, you know, a child out of wedlock, you really were sort of um, exiled from your home and your community. And we know that vulnerable people and desperate people um, do desperate things. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I also sort of understand the early feminist uh, characterization of, of alcohol, right? You know, prohibition starts as an, as an anti-domestic violence right. move, right? And so, you know, I think understanding that is, is important, but this focus on criminalization as a solution and this willingness to find allies and collaborate with, you know, Christian conservatives that really don't, uh, you know, embrace the idea that, that women should be fully autonomous right. and make choices in their own lives. And really, you know, sicking the power of the state um, on women who are making different choices uh, than you in the name of expanding women's choices has always felt uh, not right. And it always is the woman who ends up paying, right? I, or, or the, the well, sex, sex worker work is who is female. Uh, right? yeah, I mean, yeah, yes, paying the cost. Yes, yeah. absolutely. The social cost of right. uh, sexual impropriety has always sat because yeah. uh, yeah. uh, you know, and I'm not saying it's a good idea, but like you know, anti-John laws or where Johns would be arrested, et cetera, that never seems to happen. And you mentioned Elizabeth Nolan Brown is the mm -hmm. senior editor at Reason uh, uh, has a great heuristic of every time you read a story about the biggest sex trafficking ring has been broken up, bookmark it and come back to it in a month or two, and the follow-up stories will show nobody has been arrested for trafficking. It's always women being charged with prostitution. Correct. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We see that over and over again. And I, I also want to say that even in places that have, you know, implemented what's called end demand laws or the Nordic model, or sometimes the, you know, the feminist or equality model, which makes me, you know, want to throw up in my mouth. Um, everywhere that these laws have been implemented, violence against sex workers goes up. So Mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. In this country, you know, all of these stings, we, you know, we're installing surveillance cameras and massage parlors and we're, you know, raiding immigrants and we're paying police officers officers to, uh, you know, large to put their bodies on the line yeah. and go get hand jobs oh, and then arrest people. I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's amazing. literally I, that. Yeah. 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 Um, and it's like they serve, you know, they also serve who stand and wait, right. You know, right. It's, it's, uh, um, it, it's infuriating. And the more, the more you look into it, uh, the, the matter you get, but even in places that are actually arresting and pursuing, uh, you know, criminal penalties mm-hmm. against, uh, people that purchase sexual services, it doesn't have the intended effect because you, you, again, I, I keep coming back to negotiating power because I think it's, it's so fundamental. But, you know, when I was working as a sex worker, one of my, the screening practices that I was able to engage in was I asked potential clients to send me their real name and two industry references. In a world that is criminalizing sex workers, no reasonable, rational person is going to send me their legal name and evidence of them committing a crime. So now I'm in the position where I can't tell the difference between a reasonable, nervous client and a predator posing as a client. And this is exactly what we see. Uh, we also see stigma against sex work uh, go up. Um, there's a horrific case that came out of Sweden of a woman who had her children taken away from her because the court decided that although the work that she was engaged in was not criminal, it was evidence of self-harm. So they gave her children to her partner, who was an abuser, and ended up uh, murdering them in front of her. Wow. Um, let's talk about Whore's Eye View. Yeah, um, sure. Who, you know... Uh, let's uh, talk about three of your favorite sure. in history. Yeah, I think um, it's, it, I think it's easier to start in Greece. Um, but yeah, we, we, we do cover the, the 10,000 years. It is, it is my position that this 10,000 years that takes us back to what is that ancient Egypt or something? Or? I, I, Mesopotamia, okay. uh, you know, it's yeah. really, yeah. So it's maybe 8,000, but I, it's okay. my position that this predates us as a species. Do you know about the Yale study that happened? I, I, I think I'm it. about to. I love this. Yeah. So Yale spent, I don't know, maybe a million dollars. I do know that Yale is a school filled with whores. <laughs> yeah. So many kinds. Yeah. Well, they had these captive monkeys. And, you know, one of the zoologists or bio- whoever does these studies, right, introduced the concept of, m- of money into this, this captive colony of monkeys. And so, you know, they had, they were able to go to like a little monkey store and get grapes or other things that, that monkeys liked. And as soon as the concept clicked, right, as soon as, uh, the monkeys made the connection between the coins and the grapes that they liked, the first thing that happened is that a boy monkey gave a girl monkey a token and then they had sex. It's the first thing. <laughs> that happened. Um, but coming back a little bit earlier, uh, one of my favorite old pros is Phryne. Uh, she was a very powerful courtesan in ancient Greece, um, sort of at the height of their empire. And although she made most of her money entertaining the you know wealthy uh, citizens of Athens, a few times a year, the city-state would hire her to, to perform sacred rites. And she, so she would... Uh, she would dive naked into the Aegean Sea to reenact the the birth of of Aphrodite, um, and you know citizens would gather and be like, "Oh, that makes sense that our tax dollars would go to that and instead of other things that that makes perfect sense." Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I, I I don't think the NEA is going to be trying. Sure, that soon. Um, but she she became very very famous in her time and exerted a lot of mm. social power. Um, she was sort of n- notorious. She would uh, discriminate against clients and change her prices based on how she felt about them, which is a, a bold move. Um, it's and a power move. It is a power yeah. move. Well, one king um, approached her publicly, and it's it's written about. There's like it's great documentation of people's diaries uh, noting this <laughs> event. Um, he asked her at a party, uh, you know, it shames me that you would charge so much. Uh, and she responded with, if I took a cent less, it would be I who was shamed, uh, which I love. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, she this pissed This brings to mind Donald Trump, <laughs> right? And his... Uh, I think he definitely would have paid less had he paid up front, which is so often oh, true. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it is cash on the barrel head if you get a discount. I, I mean... Yeah. Um, the patriarchs of Athens were uh, mm-hmm. unhappy with the amount of power that Phryne had, and so they charged her with blasphemy 
for impersonating the goddess, which to remind you is what they'd hired her right. to do. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, she, she hires a very famous orator uh, who strips her naked in front of this all male jury and says, um, how can you look at this body and not see that she is divine? Let me guess. It ends in a hung jury. <laughs> uh, okay. um, so you mentioned mm-hmm. in passing the idea of the sacred whore as like an old, yes. you know, kind of pre-Christian perhaps. Sure. Uh, um, talk about, you know, in, in, I was raised Catholic, um, and I was raised in the 20th century. So people talked a lot about the virgin whore complex where sure. women could either be virginal or whores. Occasionally they could also be mothers and then they become, usually become desexed, et cetera. But yeah. how did the sacred whore turn into that kind of virgin whore complex? Yeah. It's the, the, what the Catholic church does to, to women is really, uh, disheartening. Um, it's interesting to take a church, right, that was made popular by one of the most, um, you know, popular female preachers. Uh, Mary Magdalene was uh, an incredible leader in the early Christian church. And um, a pope uh, in the, you know, 500s uh, decides that she was um, a sex worker, yeah. right, by conflating her with another Mary in the Bible. Um, to his defense, there are a lot of them. <laughs> uh, but he, you know, he sort of decides that, that she's a whore and that becomes doctrine for really over a thousand thousand years and that is used to justify uh you know not just sort of removing her gospel but also limiting the ability of women to to speak or become become church leaders um and i think the the categories that that were available uh to you know theologians at the time were that women were were stupid or they were evil right you're either a daughter of lilith and a you know conniving snake woman uh or you are susceptible to the you know snake oil salesman out of, of naivete either way um, you know, civilization. You need to be controlled. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Or, or led. And so, um, you know, the, the categorization, um, they were really interested in categorizing, um, women and, and it's how the Catholic Church becomes the largest brothel owner, uh, in history for a period of 400 years, uh, justifying that by saying this they group of women. They did not teach me about that <laughs> at modern day high school in, uh, Middletown, New Jersey. Yeah. It's, it's cool. interesting, um, how they, they found ways to, to fund the church. Um, they were uh, literally, uh, where did they Literally. own those brothels? Or you know, a lot of nunneries were operated as oh, right. as brothels. That's not just a, a throwaway line in Hamlet. But there's yeah, um, yeah there, it's a yeah. series of of laws, right? So the the Catholic Church you know, doubles down on celibacy, right, and like mm-hmm. loving partnership around the 1300s. Mm-hmm. And around the same time, they start passing all of these like sort of banana pants laws uh, around sex, right? Like so, like if you have sex before marriage, you're probably going to hell. But like it's not extra hell, like per event. So like mm-hmm. once you're there lean in, uh, you know, seeing uh, a prostitute or a sex worker is like kind of a minor sin, but it's not nearly so bad as either raping or seducing a good woman, right? No distinction, no distinction was made. And so the, because of this, you know, primrose path of bad logic, you end up with, with priests and more than a few popes actually owning and operating brothels. And they justify this as protecting uh, good women, right, by creating an outlet uh, of the already damned. Wow. Um, so uh, who's another sex worker from history that I, you uh, um, really like? Yeah, uh, Victoria, uh, we can get, uh, Veronica Franco um, was, became a famous poet and uh, well-renowned editor at a time and in a place where women of her class were not allowed to read or access libraries. So this is sort of the early publishing in Venice, which is a, a center of publishing. Um, she becomes a courtesan and the, the confidant of uh, men in publishing. And she is able, is able to publish. And she's, um, there, there's a lot of really great work about her story, but she really became a sex worker because of her love of reading, you know, she, uh, she was initially, um, a, a wife and married into, you know, one of the Venetian classes or whatever, but she found the restrictions on her freedom of movement to be too much. And so she chose, uh, the life of a courtesan. Um, she is another example, much like Phryne. Uh, she is charged with witchcraft, uh, mm-hmm. not once, but twice, uh, by the Inquisition and is, is able to defend herself, but it, it costs her everything. So she, you know, was this celebrated figure, uh, in Venice, but ends up sort of dying of fever in the poorest red light district, um, after spending everything that she had defending herself against 
witchcraft. Wow. Yeah. Um, a 20th century figure that, um, uh, Victoria Woodhull, right. The first woman to run for president for sure. She is, uh, she's a hoot. Uh, yeah. Mm. She's a free love advocate and a spiritualist. What, what did free love mean? Free love essentially meant that, uh, that women should have sex because they want to. So it, it, which was a a bad idea. It's it's, it's a radical idea. Very very destabilizing to any kind of society. It it does seem to have an impact for sure. Uh, She herself um, was divorced uh, from a a doctor who was sort of um, a non-functioning alcoholic. Uh, She begins a relationship with a a gentleman later in life who is a, a free love advocate. They, they do, have a bit of an open marriage and she one of her claims to fame uh in addition to running for president and starting a newsletter and and doing this brokerage firm is she exposes uh the hypocrisy of a love triangle um with one of the most famous ministers um at the time and one of the most uh famous feminists and so right. she publishes do, can, do you, can you name them I, is it I, Til- it's, Tilton and who Har- Harriet Beecher Stowe's brother which right, I know Lyman Beecher or I something like I don't that remember. let's it's, not defame them sure, yes. by accident. But yeah, it's it's yeah. amazing, right? Yeah. Because that is always part of the power when you speak as a whore is that you can show Call out hypocrisy. hypocrisy right? right. And it, it's really this, this is the way that she's destroyed, right? So she calls out this famous minister in her newspaper. And then Anthony Comstock at the time uses this to file an obscenity charge against her. And she is actually, she, she has to flee the country. And this is the way that Anthony Comstock, who would later go on to criminalize contraception and abortion and drive, uh, many, you know, sex therapists and educators to, to suicide, he, he makes his career on publicly destroying uh, Victoria Woodhull. Is there a moment, um, you know, I, I think about this uh, partly, I guess, because I'm Catholic and because I was raised in the 20th century, but a figure like Madonna, the singer, kind of blew apart the virgin whore complex in society. I mean, there's, if, if you look at literary history, people, great, tw- you know, post-war 20th century American novelists, mm-hmm. people like Saul Bellow and Norman Mailer and uh, Philip Roth, There are only virgins and whores in their books. And kind of like after Madonna, it seems like the the slate of characters or the slate of subject positions that women can occupy in real life and in popular culture and in high culture has really expanded. Does does that sound right to you? I I hope that's Mm. true. I would like very much for that to be true. I feel like I see, uh, you know, some some troubling trends uh, Mm. in the way that we talk about sex, the way that we continue to demonize sex. I think that we are certainly living through another moral Mm. sex panic. Um, And I... I know too well how the policing of prostitution can uh, have a huge impact on the sexual freedom of women, Mm -hmm. freedom of movement, freedom of expression. So Mm -hmm. I know that we have come back uh, from this level of freedom before. Yeah. And it's interesting you had mentioned the the case in Sweden and Mm -hmm. the Nordic model. You know, again, if you're of a certain age, you grew up knowing that people in Sweden and uh, Norway weren't sexually hung up, (laughs) Um, but they're actually incredibly repressed societies in all sorts of ways. Yeah. And this, you know, demonization of clients and the conflation of clients with predators has led Mm. to a lot of really, really bad policy. And I think it really comes down to, you know, listening to victims. Um, Before we get to questions, can you kind of sketch out what are, what are the types of reforms that are in place now or that you old pros is pushing that will, you know, both from a, a kind of cultural level, but also a legal level. Like, what are what are what's in play that's exciting, and who is backing uh, sex work reform? Sure. Uh, you know, I think that sex work. What, what old prose focuses on is narrative change, right? So we're very interested in reminding folks, especially people in power, that we are already living in a society with sex workers, right? That sex workers are already contributing members uh, of our communities. There have been a lot of exciting uh, legislative pushes recently. There was a ballot initiative in Burlington, Vermont, that actually won 64 percent to remove uh, some old language uh, criminalizing sex work. Now, you know, city ordinance does not trump state law. Mm. Sex work was not decriminalized, but it showed that voters are really ready to, to reconsider their position on this. I think public policy polling found in 2018 that, 
you know, 44% of the electorate is ready to, to decriminalize sex work, 55% um, in D.C. There have um, there've also been uh, sex, very brave sex workers all across the country that have been, you know, self-organizing for decades that have succeeded in changing laws in uh, New Hampshire, in Rhode Island. There's a huge push in Oregon and Washington State. Um, and a lot of these conversations start with harm reduction, right? Patients' Bill of Rights, um, ending the kind of mandatory reporting that prevents sex workers from being able to report crimes against us. So being able to report crimes against us, being able to tell our medical providers the truth about our work without risking criminal penalty, I think is a really good first step. Um, also making it easier to remove criminal penalties, right? Once you've been it's interesting to me that we we say that we want to discourage the oldest profession by criminalizing it, but the fastest and most effective way of trapping somebody in prostitution uh, is arresting them for it. It's interesting that harm reduction, which is also a, a movement growing uh, in drug legalization mm -hmm. circles of saying, you know, whatever you think about the morality or anything, it's just, you know, is a policy creating more problems than it's solving or whatever. So, it seems like when it comes to prohibition, we're in a moment where harm reduction is being discussed more and more seriously across a, a variety of vices. Yeah, I hope so. And I know that sex workers have, you know, a lot, a lot to contribute to that. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, we, we can get, um, we can, we can save a lot of lives, uh, by focusing on just what it is, you know, harm reduction. But when we focus on coercive control, we focus on punishing or trying to end a behavior that we've decided as a moral bad, then I do think that more often than not, we cause more harm than good. Is there, you know, you've talked a little bit about how in the past, the coalitions that criminalize prostitution, you know, weren't necessarily what you expect or, you know, pornography. Right now is is sex work reform, is it a conservative issue, a liberal issue? Is there any, does it map onto contemporary politics in any meaningful way? Sure. I mean, for, for me, sitting as a, a comedian and a sex worker rights advocate, it, it very much is like a pox on, on both your houses, right? Mm -hmm. Republicans and Democrats both have like dumb ideas about um, how to police prostitution. Um, conservative Republicans are often coming at it from a place of, uh, you know, uh, punishment and criminalization. And then, you know, progressives are often coming at it from a place of um, end demand or, or even regulation, right? Like mandatory SDI tests, uh, you know, workplace um, protections that end up sort of forcing people into, uh, you know, like a regulated uh, system or structure. And we've, we've already talked about the, the harms of that. Um, hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's open it up for questions. Um, if you would like to ask a question, could you stand up and stand under the mic microphone a few steps oh, back? And uh, please uh, ask a question. Ask a question or tell a very good story. <laughs> but ask a question. Uh, back to your insights. Uh, could you uh, elaborate a bit more on your objection to the idea of no criminal penalties at all for those who sell sex, but severe criminal penalties for those who buy sex. And as you know, since I gather you attended the Soul Forum debate on this, that idea was fairly successfully Correct. defended at the Soul Forum. So what is your objection to that idea? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, and, and it's a great one. Um, and my, my primary objection is that everywhere that we've seen that policy implemented, it increases violence against sex workers. So it fails at achieving its stated intent, um, and it does so by conflating um, you know, clients with predators, reducing the negotiating power of providers, and creating an apparatus that makes it harder for us to do our work, um, making it harder for us to get money or you know, places to engage in sex work has never made sex workers safer. Um, so yeah, I think that's my primary objection, is the results of the, of the law. Next question. Hi. Uh, Hi. To your knowledge, has there been any significant variation over time or across cultures between the delineations between uh, prostitution versus normal sexual interactions, acceptable sexual interactions? Um, thank Probably you. Probably the monkeys. 
for instance? Yeah. Um, thank you. That's a that's a great question. And I, I think what I've found in in you know studying mostly Western history um, is that the conflation between promiscuity or sex outside of marriage with prostitution um, is very old. And that when we see laws that criminalize prostitution, you often see a crackdown in, in literally public women. Uh, you know, we see that a lot with the enforcement of loitering for the purposes of prostitution, which has always meant uh, being in public and making the wrong kind of eye contact with a cop. Thank you. Um, thank you. So uh, actually, this is a follow-up kind of to what she was asking about uh, the whole kind of infrastructure, the whole economy of sex work. So um, I mean, so there's a lot of demonization of all, you know, all sides and all parts of this supply chain, if you will, of, uh, of sex work and, and all this form. So what do you think is, is, you know, what should be done about this whole debate about, for example, you know, people who are engaged in providing various services, housing, transportation, mm -hmm. all these things that are easy, easily turned into, you know, pimping, uh, sex trafficking and so on. So can you say a bit about what you think should be done about those issues? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really great question. You know, I think that we have... We have had only great questions. That's true. Really great yes. questions. Um, I, uh, it's interesting. Um, we've been sold a false narrative, right, about victims and villains in this work, right? And so it's the the false narrative that drives these end-demand policies, is that anyone engaging in this work is a victim and anyone facilitating or participating um, as a buyer is a is a villain. And I think that that fundamental false narrative um, is something that that we have to unpack. And, and you're absolutely right. Sex workers need service providers in order to do their job. They hire schedulers, they hire screeners, they hire drivers. They, you know, they pay people to to clean up. Um, and many of these people face severe legal penalties and are charged as procurers or pimps or you know, uh, you know, uh, facilitating uh, living off the proceeds of, of prostitution. And this kind of criminalization of all of the things around prostitution uh, leads to um, a lot of isolation um, and, and a lot of really bad outcomes. And so. The reality is that if you remove criminal penalties from the act of adult consensual sex work, then you empower people who have been hit by their manager, who are being abused by their boyfriend, who are being exploited by a third party to report the crime committed against them or take action to self-advocate. But the criminal penalties do nothing except reduce the negotiating power of the most vulnerable. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. I'm wondering if you could speak about porn a little bit more. Sure. Um, I think a lot of people who would agree with the kind of local madame at the saloon see the sort of scale of the porn industry as a difference not only of degree but of kind. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the arguments are not only the kind of Andrea Dworkin arguments about porn. They're you know documentaries <clears throat> like Hot Girl Wanted where people look at this industry and even people who might be sympathetic to your argument and sort of see something amiss here. Um, and I, I'd love your thoughts about it. Yeah, I think, uh, that, again, thank you. That's an, an insightful question. Um, and I think that the best critiques of the porn industry are coming from porn performers. And I think what you've seen um, is, you know, sort of a monopolization or a, a concentration of power amongst a few, a, you know, a few distributors, right, where the uh, the performers or the content creators are not able to to command, right, the, the kind of income um, that, or living wage. And I think that a, a lot of this is facilitated by discrimination of sex workers across platforms, right? So, you know, OnlyFans is a, is a good example of a platform that allows sex workers to build individual relationships with their clients and command a lot of that income. But many of the porn distributors, right, are uh, distributing porn where, you know, somebody was paid, uh, you know, a few bucks a long time ago. Um, they buy the rights and there's, there's too much free porn on the internet, uh, I think is, is the answer. So um, I do not take a moral position against porn, but I think that porn performers uh, and content creators have a lot of smart ideas about the kinds of laws that they would like to see changed. And I would like to create a society where we can listen to them. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hello. So um, my question is based in my lived experience as a queer person of color who also has experience in sex work. And I was thinking, as you were speaking through different histories, especially around the early 20th century, I was thinking about um, as you were using the word women, you were really talking about white women. Correct. And 
My question is, how are you using your platform to hold space for the history and impact of policy on people of color and also non-binary and trans sex workers? Thank you so much for that question. I think it's really important for us to speak uh, from our own experience. And I do come to this conversation as, you know, a cis white citizen. And I bring all of my privilege into all of the jobs that I've ever done, um, including sex work. Um, at Old Pros, we seek to hire uh, lots of different kinds of people. We try to interview um, and elevate lots of different kinds of people with lots of different kinds of experience. If you go through the library of our content, I think that you'll see that we have elevated a lot of those stories. Um, but I come to this conversation as a very privileged uh, white woman and speak primarily from that experience. Could you talk a little bit about the Mann Act? Um, and you mentioned this, I think, in passing, but a lot of the fear was that black men were transporting yes. white women across state borders, mm -hmm. you know, and you would always, you know, if you're in Ohio, you go to Indiana to have sex, right? But I mean, what what was going on there, and is that fear, you know, is is it still alive, but in a in a different, you know, kind of wrapper or something? For sure, so much of our prostitution policy and moral panic in general is is grounded in racism, right? It it was called the Man Act. It was known as the White Slave Law, um, and you know, so much of it was directed. Uh, you know, this is sort of the you know a few decades after the Emancipation Proclamation, right? You know, so uh, you're looking at sort of the first free black generation. Uh, and there's a lot of anxiety around white women really having consensual sexual relationships with, with black and immigrant men. And this is sold, right, as like, this is a rape story. Uh, but, you know, we didn't legalize uh, interracial marriage in this country until I think, you know, the mid 1960s. Yeah, the, the final law was right. struck down by the Supreme Court in 67. But we didn't criminalize marital rape until the 1990s. Mm -hmm. So if limiting rape is what we were trying to do, then that's that's not what we did. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Thank you for this conversation. Um, my question is on the path toward decriminalization. Uh, and I know that DSW and Normal have a lot uh, aligned when it comes to uh, decrim. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of cannabis decrim came from uh, medical use, mm -hmm. and I know that sexual proxies is a path toward decrim in um, sex work. I was wondering if there's also a path in considering that a lot of sex workers or people that come to sex work are coming from spaces of disability, mm -hmm. uh, and how that could be considered a potential path toward decrim. For sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, at Old Pros, we uh, we just uh, we just did our disability one pager. I'm very I'm very proud of that. Thank you. Um, you know, disabled people both uh, sell uh, and purchase sexual services. I think it's um, it's a really important conversation to have. Um, you know. Uh, sex work uh, famously allows you to set your own schedule and provides a lot of flexibility and um, accessibility that, uh, you know, more traditional employment doesn't. And of course, um, you know, people with disabilities, uh, you know, also uh, purchase sexual services. And that's an important conversation to have, um, you know, back going back to the, the sort of, you know, priestess prostitutes of, of ancient your healing and sexual energy have uh, a long and shared history. And I know many, many people who come to this work, um, you know, as, uh, as healers. Could you talk a little bit about um, the kind of medicalized sex work? Because this is a growing field. Is it legal in places where, uh, you know, the people who are either disabled or for whatever reason, I mean, purchase sex as for medical reasons, there's there's sex surrogacy. There is, uh, you know, sex um, sex therapy. There is uh, tantra, which is like a whole world of of sex therapy. Um, and the the criminalization is is confusing. There was a, a famous case recently. A woman named uh, Tracy Elise, um, who is still serving time um, in Arizona for having run a, a, a tantric uh, school, essentially. Um, and so it it really depends on the state. And it depends on the prosecutor. What I will say is that you know most you know wealthy white people, regardless of whether or not the what they're yeah. doing is criminalized, are not facing the same kind of criminal penalties. Right. Yeah. Next question. Um, speaking of moral panics, I feel like one moral panic that hasn't been addressed tonight is kind of the freak out surrounding drag queens, surrounding yes. uh, trans people as well, which is very. Relevant. I mean, I, it seems like Matt Walsh is trending on Twitter every single day. Um, so I, I just would broadly yeah. am interested in your thoughts on that, where it's going. 
Sure. I mean, the, the LGBT movement and the sex worker rights movement have always been interconnected. You know, the uh, Marsh P. Johnson was, you know, f- through the, the shock glass heard around the world and sex workers have always been in queer spaces and, and vice versa. And I think that, you know, the demonization of the LGBT community and the demonization of sex workers follow very similar paths. And I think we're wrong about who the predators are in both cases. You know, it's not uh, this sort of imagined, um, demonized version of a, of a drag queen that's likely to, um, you know, sexually assault a child, right? It's coaches, it's ministers, it's people already in our community. And I think it is our fundamental unwillingness to sort of look at that and look at the real source um, of where violence is coming from that sort of drives us uh, to try to find these scapegoats, you know, outside of our outside of our community. And I, um, I see exactly what you mean. And it makes me very nervous, too. I will uh, point out a reason the uh, pushback on drag uh, drag queen story hours in public libraries is generally that they're in public libraries. We would prefer, you know, a, a Barnes and Noble or a private bookstore would be uh, much better for us as good libertarians. Yes. Thank you both so much for such an important, fascinating conversation. Um, I'd love to hear you talk more about pleasure. Sure. Um, you know, I really appreciated your, you know, sharing with us your own your own relationship to sex uh, and how that plays into your sex work. But I'm wondering how you think about um, us being in a sex-negative, conflicted culture, uh, which kind of has deep roots in Western culture, yeah. and if you can speak to that, how yeah, that plays into all of what we're talking about. I'm, I'm happy to. You know, we, we're certainly, you know, sitting um, in a society that has a, a long simmering uh, uh, hatred and discouragement of specifically female sexual pleasure, right? And so, you know, the demonization and criminalization of promiscuity, the demonization of, of the sacred whore, and I think it's interesting, you know, we spent 6,000 years encouraging men uh, to make their brides bleed on their wedding night and then had the audacity to complain about how hard it is uh, to make women come. Uh, and I think that if we had a different um, cultural narrative around that, that that would be, that would be hugely helpful. Um, and I do think that, you know, that uh, I'm very biased on this, but I think that sort of, you know, re-inviting uh, the sacred whore back into uh, our concept of, of, of humanity is, is really important. But yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, and in many places around the world, um, the the criminalization of like sex toys uh, is more aggressively po- policed uh, than than prostitution um, itself. So you're absolutely right. There's a, a very old conflation and hang up there. Um, we all have a lot to get over. If if I may mm-hmm. speak up for Western civilization, sure. <laughs> uh, just now briefly, and, and on this question of pleasure, which is fascinating because. Mm-hmm. You know, now we are all supposed to be good at everything, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we're good at work, and then we come home and we make great cocktails and meals, and everybody's, you know, a star in the sack, and we feel pleasure more than ever. And yet it seems it's so performative. It, I mean, can we really take pleasure in sex when we have to be great at it? I mean, whether we have to be great at it or whether it's, it's commodified, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, there's a, there are questions to be raised, right? About authenticity and emotional labor. And like, or you, you fake know. it till you make it. Right. right? Yeah. Does I your mean, waitress yeah. really like you? Yeah. Uh, you know, but it's, it's also true that in the West, I mean, you know, in this question of female sexual pleasure and how that can be destabilizing compared to, you know, certain, when, when we look at, say, Catholicism, versus Islam. I don't know. It seems like the Catholics have a pretty good story. I don't know. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah no, I, uh, no. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yes. Well, is there a part of the world that is, um, you know, that is actually liberated or is this something that's deeper, that's written on us before culture emerges? I don't think that, I do think that this is culturally imposed, but mm-hmm. I think that, you know, Catholicism uh, and Islam, which is you know another another place that uh, you and know it's the, the Abrahamic religions. Yes, the Abrahamic okay. religions exactly um, have you know uh, consumed a lot of territory, mm-hmm. and in so doing, uh, bulldozed past and into mm-hmm. a lot of cultures that had a radically re- different mm-hmm. relationship with pleasure and sex and bodies and prostitution. Mm-hmm. Next question. 
question I have is, I think you alluded a couple of times to the contributions that sex workers and everybody has made to society. Um, I think that sounds a little bit strange to people because it's so much in the shadows that I think the problem is that people don't see it. Maybe just the people like us who look for it. I mean, I'm an accountant. I, I see it from the inside contributions that people make and the taxes that they pay. I'll bet you, I'll bet you that one in a hundred people think that um, sex workers pay any income taxes. So, I mean, what do we do to kind of change that narrative? Thank you for your question, and thank you for the work that you do helping sex workers do their taxes. That's a very, it's very important. It's the Lord's work. Uh, it's a mess. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, um, I came out um, a long time ago in 2000, in 2015. Um, I found myself in uh, an abusive relationship with, with a, a Catholic, so, you know, I okay. might be biased. Sure. Um, Irish Catholic, because I like cliches. Mm. Uh, but, you know, he, he really used Just and leveraged. Just it wasn't a priest or no, a pope. No, no, okay. no, finance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, he was really using my, my history as a sex worker um, as a vulnerability point to keep me in what had become a very violent relationship relationship, right? Because he knew that um, I, or he presumed uh, that I did not want to be to be outed. Um, and so I sort of took that option away from him uh, by writing publicly about my story. And I've found a lot of safety and security in choosing to live my life as a as an out sex worker. And I think that, you know, going back into the archives and, and pulling these stories from history, and and you're absolutely right. I mean, the oldest profession is, is literally everywhere. Uh, everywhere you look, you find um, old pros. We are integral uh, to, to all of civilization. Um, and I think reminding people of that, allowing them to sort of stand tall in their legacy, I hope uh, creates the conditions for people to come out to their own community. And I think similar to the LGBT movement, what's true is that everyone in this room already knows and probably likes, uh, maybe even loves a sex worker. That's great. Uh, last question. Uh, so I've heard you talk a lot today about sort of the external culture around sex work and how we're proceeding from that. I'm assuming, I don't, I'm not going to make judgments about the room, but I'm taking a look around and guessing at least half the people here are not sex workers. Sure. So I, I've had a history myself, you know, I don't know if you can tell by the outfit. And like, <laughs> I'm curious to know what you think about the internal culture of the parts that are finger quotes <clears throat> working in sex work, because as someone who's been there and seen it, and I'm assuming a lot of people in this room have not, it's not exactly like that's all sunshine and rainbows either. Sure. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really toxic elements that have been normalized because of the isolation. That's Correct. That's you're talking about. So I'm just curious if you have any reflections on that. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's, uh, sex work can be very isolating. I think, again, going back to this idea that sex work is a really broad umbrella term, right? You know, I know a lot of folks show up to a strip club. A lot of people make content alone in their room. A lot of folks, you know, see a small group of folks that, you know, trade, uh, clients and, and harm reduction information. And so, um, I think it's very, it's very localized, but you're absolutely right. The criminalization, the stigma, the need to live a double life, um, what is asked of uh, such a stigmatized community has, um, you know, isolated and vulnerable people are, are just that vulnerable. And is it one solution is to really just be more open or transparent about it? I, I, I mean, you never want to force transparency on people, but within the sex work community, if people are talking more openly, there's fewer secrets to hide or... What I have found, and again, I come to this conversation as a, as a very privileged person, but I found a lot of safety uh, in community and surrounding myself with people that already knew and accepted and had done whatever processing they needed to, uh, to absorb uh, the, the fact that I, you know, sold sex for money um, or at one point had done that. And so um, I also know lots of people who have lost their kids, who have been fired, who have faced legal reper repercussions uh, and, and been further isolated and further vulnerable um, and pushed into deeply exploitative system situations after coming out to their community. So it's never something that I would counsel an individual person, uh, especially someone that I didn't know to do or to take that risk. But I do believe that on the collective, the more of us who are able to come out out, uh, we do find each other. You know, when you tell your story, people tell you theirs. 
and I've never been in a room uh, where no one had done sex work. Well, there. Yeah. Um, can I just ask one follow-up? Of course, sure. Because I, I kind of want to, I want to push on an element there because I feel like we're talking about that in the microcosmic sense. Mm -hmm. I'm talking more macrocosmic. I'm talking to people who are like, I'm top zero one on OnlyFans, and I'm all over Twitter, and I'm all over your social media, and I've gamed this system, but it also offends me that you're trying to take my crown. There is a culture of infighting in the industry to a degree, especially the content people. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means, you know, in other industries, but I'm curious if, like, that specifically. I'm talking about the side that the system has incentivized by making us fight each other to some degree. And we and that those elements that have caused, do, like, do you know what I'm talking about here? I do know what you're talking about, but I've also, like been a stand-up comic for a decade <laughs> and you know and i'm just like yeah. i don't know how much of this is like unique to sex work or just no. you know the nature of competition okay. yeah All right, thank you. of course oh. um one uh trope that seems almost as old as prostitution itself is the hooker with a heart of gold sure. um is there uh is there a novel is there uh you know a movie a play or a, a work of fiction that you think best captures the complexity and reality of sex work? Absolutely. I think Trading Spaces uh, did it the best. I'm sorry, Trading Places? Trading Places, yeah, oh, Trading yeah. Places. I'm so sorry. Trading, I was going to say Trading Spaces I'm sorry. is the yeah, show yeah, where you no, no, no. do your neighbors. Hilarious. Yes, yeah, that, that would be, be like, it's a whole different show. Yeah, yeah that, would be, that would still be on the air, I think. But uh, So Trading Places is yeah. with Dan Aykroyd, Jamie yes. Lee Curtis, and Eddie Murphy. And Jamie Lee Curtis, I think, yeah. plays a hooker with a heart of gold. Absolutely. Yeah. But and, it's, uh, yes, and but I also think kind of complicated. It is complicated. Yeah. And, and what I love about her is that, you know, so she, she takes this, uh, this gig, right, without yeah. a lot of information. Information and it ends up being sort of an immoral thing. You know, it wasn't like, hey, here's a hundred bucks to ruin this guy's life, right? It was like, here's a hundred dollars to, you know, to kiss this guy. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, begins, begins a cascade. But I think it's her, you know, position as a sex worker that sort of allows her to like see his vulnerability and see the situation that he's in and also make the calculated decision to help him with the presumed payoff at the end. There's a lot going yeah. on in, uh, in trading, in trading places. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Caitlin Bailey of Old Pros. Thank you. Thanks so much for talking. Thank you so much for having me.